Good morning. It's Friday. Welcome to First Light. We're in Zechariah chapter 12. We're kind of headed toward the end of Zechariah. When we're finished with Zechariah, by the way, we're going to go back to Ezra. I think it's around chapter 5. So I look forward to, to that. But tonight, today, we're in Zechariah chapter 12. And this is an interesting piece of scripture. I mentioned to you yesterday that... Um, People get tripped up in, in lots of ways, uh, one of which is chapter divisions. Okay, we've got chapter 12, and then it starts with chapter 13. And so subconsciously, in many people's brains, they assume that chapters, there may be a thought flow, but they are discontinuous. They're, there's a discontinuity. They're, they're not really connected. And that is not true necessarily at all. You have to remember that uh, the original Bible, earliest manuscripts, were not had no chapters. There were no chapters. Chapters were, generally speaking, added in the Middle Ages by monks and monasteries in order to help people find passages of Scripture and sort of organize the Scriptures. And by the way, I'm glad they did it. However, there's a few places where... They did not place the division between chapters, the transitions between chapters, in the best places. So, for example, when I look at chapter 12 of Zechariah and I look at chapter 13, I notice they're approximately the same size. So, I think that was the determining factor uh, back in the Middle Ages as to why there's a chapter break there. However, what I want you to notice is, I, I sort of planned to seed with you yesterday, that the first part, for sure, of chapter 13 actually goes with chapter 12. They are one unit. And the reason I know that is because of the repetitious phrase, on that day, on that day, this will happen, on that day, that will happen, on that day, this will happen. And it says it over and over and over again. For that reason, this should all be taken as a unit. Now, what is this about? Well, let's kind of start reading and we'll look at it. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Remember, we have moved in Zechariah from dealing with the present, which is the issues related to building the temple, following God, trusting him. And, and now Zechariah is looking to the future from the time period that he is living in. And so the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the spirit of a man within him declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all of the surrounding peoples reeling. Literally, it's actually drunkenness. I'm going to make Israel a cup that causes the other peoples to be drunk. And when you're, the reason this is translated this way is because when you're, a, a person is really, really drunk, I wouldn't know myself because I've never been that way. But uh, when people are really, really drunk, they're staggering. They can't walk in a straight line. That's why we have sobriety tests. Um, and so uh, God is going to do something through Israel to other nations that's just going to, Knock them silly, as another way that we might say it in the in the uh, old deep south. So I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. Well, that's an army attacking of some kind, right? On that day, there's the first occurrence, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah. I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because... The Lord Almighty is their God. Now, when is this talking about? I'm not 100% certain. Um, most, many scholars think that this is referring to some something related to the end time, maybe the Battle of Armageddon, some, some, some future time when Israel will be attacked. Um, I don't know for sure. So when I, when I encounter verses like this, especially prophetic verses, where 
it's not as clear as people would make it out to be, that they know exactly when it's in the future. It's a prophecy by its very definition. It's uncertain and sometimes unclear. So what I do is I don't get hung up on the parts that aren't clear. I zero in for my personal edification and growing in the Lord. I zero in on the parts that are clear and do make sense. For example, I underlined verse 5. Because regardless of this prophecy of what God's going to do for Jewish people, this is a general principle that is true for everybody. The people in Jerusalem are strong. Why? Because the Lord Almighty is their God. Well, friends, I submit to you, that's the secret in your life as well and mine. You are strong, spiritually speaking, you're strong in the Lord. The Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, stand in the strength of his might. So you see how there are people who just take the approach. Well, this was a prophecy written to people long ago. It has nothing to do with us. Well, wait a second. In some measure, yes. But on the other hand, are there any general spiritual principles that are lifted up that you find elsewhere in the Bible, especially in the New Testament? And the answer is in verse 5, you sure do. There's one right there. You are strong in the Lord. It's because of the Lord. Well, it goes on and uh, about these these uh, armies that will attack Israel and God is going to defend Israel. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is going to be in the last days. I don't know when this is going to be. And to be honest with you, I just don't get hung up on it. And that may surprise some of you. And I'm telling you, if you want to make a lot of money and draw a big crowd, you just start preaching about end times. And people just flock because they're curious. There's an insatiable curiosity about end times. Um, I have a concern with this insatiable desire about end times. Uh, and the example is because I've, I've known some people who could tell you every little detail about Revelation. They could tell you every little detail about Daniel. They could tell you every little detail about passages like this in Zechariah, but they couldn't explain uh, Galatians to you. One of the most basic foundational books in the whole Bible. If you don't understand Galatians, you don't understand the whole Bible. You don't understand the kingdom of God. You don't understand the plan of salvation. You don't understand what God came to do in Jesus Christ. It is a very basic book of the Bible. And so um, I'm, I'm just telling you some of my value system. I just don't get hung up and caught up in all this stuff. I focus on stuff that applies to me because here is, I had a guy tell me one time, well, Brother Ronnie, you got to be ready for Jesus coming back. And I said, I am ready. Oh, yeah, but see, the way you're ready is you you got to study the Scripture. you got to figure out all this. And when you do that, then you're ready. And I said, come on. What is it? You know what it means to be ready? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're loving Jesus, if you're living for him, how can you not be ready even if you know nothing about the end times? How about let's live for Jesus and not get so caught up in what's going to happen sometime far off in the future? Jesus is coming back. I believe it. I wish it was tonight. But friends, people have been thinking that and wishing it for a long time, hoping for it. But I'm not going to be caught simply staring at the sky when Jesus comes back. I'd rather be washing people's feet. I'd rather be loving Jesus. I'd rather be in a time of worship. I'd rather be studying his word. I'd rather be actively living out the kingdom of God. And if you're doing that, well, you're ready. <laughs> you're ready. Well, I say all of that to say, wow, you get to verse 10. Verse 10 kind of changes everything for me. So, I, you know, I don't know when all this battle part, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I like verse 10. See, I hang my hat on stuff that I can understand. I just don't lose sleep over what, I, what I'm I, I having a hard time understanding. I zero in on what I do understand. And so verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. 
the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, and each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the, the clan of the house of David and their wives, and the clan of the house of Nathan, and he was a prophet, and of their wives, the clan of the house of Levi, the priests, and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. Now, a common interpretation is, is that, that um, they will look on me whom they have pierced, that this awfully sure seems to sound like Jesus, who was pierced, and that, that the nation of Israel will come to a point in the future when they, in great vast numbers, turn to Jesus. They, they, will, they will see him for who he is, and they will mourn for what they have left off and not followed nor understood. And friends, I, have, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I, I know there are a lot of people that teach that. But here, here's one of the things that I'm a little bit curious about, is if this is, on, if this is all in the future, in the last days, you know, we're talking near the end of the world, and there's going to be a great turning of Jewish people to the Lord because they're going to look on him whom, who was pierced. Um, maybe that's what it's saying. The only difficulty that I have is chapter 13, which goes with chapter 12. It's still part of the same passage. Don't let the chapter division fool you. Chapter 13, verse 1, on that day. Well, on what day? On that day that the nations come together? And on that day that uh, they look on the one who is pierced and they mourn, on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Now, friends, I, you, you need to understand Scripture as a whole. That's why you should read the whole thing. The more you read it, the more you see like puzzle pieces, things fit together. So when I read, as soon as my ears perk up, as soon as I see cleansing from sin and impurity, I cannot help but think about Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So forgiveness is impossible without the shedding of blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar that you may make atonement for your sins. The whole concept of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament is that animals died in the place of human beings. Their blood paid for the sins of people. And that idea is carried forward and meets its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God, as John said, John the Baptist, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, our Passover Lamb, has been slain, Paul says. Revelation, I looked and I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins. So, I think that it makes much more sense to me, and I could be wrong. I, I'm admitting that to you. I just can't get the crucifixion, Golgotha, off of my mind here. That was a day that a fountain was opened up for forgiveness from sin, cleansing of sin and impurity. And people did look on the one whom... They had pierced, and I want you to notice a couple of things about this. First of all, the um, the Bible in the New Testament quotes this very passage about piercing um, at least twice. So, for example, it is quoted almost exactly like this in the book of Revelation, chapter one, when we have some image about Jesus and some something about his return in the introductory remarks of Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Look, he is coming in the 
he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now, this is not a study of Revelation, but I'm just trying to help you see that it's interesting that the author of Revelation, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sees this passage in Zechariah chapter 12 as applying to Jesus somehow, that he is the one who is pierced. Then you go to the Gospels in the Gospel according to John, and you will remember that Jesus, um, the, the, the Gospels make it very clear that the Romans, in order to end a crucifixion execution, in order to end it quickly, they would break the legs of the people being crucified. And the reason for that is, is because when you're strung up, you can't breathe. And so it, as excruciating as it was, people would push with their feet in order to gasp for breath. It's a horrible way to die. One of the most evil ways of killing people that's ever been invented. Well, by breaking the legs, you can't push up anymore. And so people died within minutes of asphyxiation because you can't breathe anymore. Well, when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But we're also told that a guard, just to make sure he was dead, didn't break his legs, but took a spear and thrust it up into his side. And he would have pierced the pericardial area of Jesus and outflowed water and what looked like water and blood. And then John, the gospel writer, adds these words at the crucifixion of Jesus, at his death. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. They will look on the one they have pierced. So see, John, John is saying um, here in the Gospel of John that seeing Jesus pierced by a spear fulfills the prophecy we just read in, uh, in Zechariah. Whereas in Revelation, it's uh, maybe looking at the return of Jesus. People will look on the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn. The inhabitants of the earth will mourn. If we were doing a study of Revelation, which we're not, uh, you would find that the inhabitants of the earth is a is a is a is a phrase that consistently refers to lost people. So I, I like to say that everybody, every at the return of Jesus, everybody says, "Oh boy!" Everybody does. Everybody does. So some of the people in the world, when they see Jesus, when they see Jesus, ah. Oh, Oh, when they see him, they're going to go, oh boy, this is it. This is it. He's coming back. My Savior has arrived. But the vast majority of people who reject Christ, who turn from him, they're going to say, oh boy, oh boy. They're going to mourn. That's my humorous way of saying they're going to mourn. It is not going to be a positive experience when Jesus returns. Well, back to Zechariah. Isn't it interesting that uh, Zechariah chapter uh, 12, verse 10, gets all kind of interpretation. Uh, you can read all kind of interpretations. And there seems to be a little bit of confusion, as sometimes happens, with translating ancient Hebrew. In this case, some of the difficulties with the translation have to do with manuscript evidence. What you need to know, if you didn't already is that um, until the 1950s, the oldest copies of the Old Testament Hebrew that anybody had anywhere in any museum in existence dated to about 1000 AD, which is pretty old. But that was the oldest Hebrew document of the scriptures that anybody had anywhere. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 50s and 60s and analyzed and on. And that was such an astounding discovery, not only for New Testament documents, but especially for Old Testament documents, because they had copies of the Old Testament Bible scrolls that were dated a thousand years or more earlier than the earliest documents, that the oldest documents that were in a museum anywhere. 
the documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls dated to at or before, sometimes long before, the time of Jesus. And it's interesting that later Hebrew scrolls um, phrase chapter 10 slightly differently. And your Bible might have a different phraseology. Okay? They will look on the one they have pierced. We'll say that's kind of neutral, isn't it? They will look on the one they have pierced. But when you go to the older manuscripts, you find they will look on me. And who's the one talking? It's a prophecy. It's God talking. The concept of God being pierced. Now that's that's strange. That's odd. Why, why would, how in the world could that even possibly happen? Well, here's something a little bit interesting to throw in. Also, you should go on the internet, do a search, go to Britannica online, go to lots of places, and just do a little bit of research. Who invented crucifixion? When did that start? You will find that the Persians are credited with inventing this awful form of torturing somebody and executing them, the Persians. And one of the first Persians to employ crucifixion on a wide, grotesquely wide scale is King Darius, who lived when Zach, uh, in the same century that Zacharias did. Darius the first, who came, who was a Persian, who conquered Babylon. He, in, in one particular instance, I, I saw, um, is credited with, with crucifying 3,000 people at one time, in one time period, as a form of execution. So this is important. So crucifixion was invented around the same time period that Zechariah is writing these words under the inspiration as a prophetic word from God uh, Almighty. Okay, so it's not so much unusual. Would people in Israel have immediately thought of crucifixion when they read these words? Well, we don't know. They might have or they might not. But this is important now. I just told you when crucifixion is credited with being invented, right? Well, go back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. This is considered a messianic prophecy by King David. King David. This is the very this is the very psalm that Jesus began to quote when he was dying on the cross. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out to you. You are enthroned as the Holy One, the praise of Israel, and on it goes. And then it talks about bulls surrounding me, roaring like roaring lions, tearing their prey. I'm poured out like water in verse 14, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. So many people have seen this as so many similarities with crucifixion. Then you get to verse 16. Dogs have surrounded me. By the way, it's interesting that Gentiles were often called dogs. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have made holes in my hands and my feet. Now friends, this written by King David was written hundreds and hundreds of years before crucifixion had ever been invented. Now, I found it interesting that I look at my footnote in my Bible and it tells me that this part about they have pierced my hands and feet, that another, that, that's in some, it says some Hebrew manuscripts say pierced. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, says that. The Syriac version of the Bible in a different language 
uh, the Hebrew Bible says that, and a lot of Hebrew manuscripts. But another group of manuscripts say, like a lion. You might read that and go, okay. So dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. Like a lion, my hands and feet. Okay. I'm not even sure that makes sense. Now, if dogs have surrounded me and then like a lion, that kind of fits. But my hands and feet, that it doesn't have any verb. It doesn't do anything. What, what is that? My hands and feet, what is that? Well, it turns out that the difference in these translations is one Hebrew letter. Okay, so um, one Hebrew letter. Pierced is ka'aru. The u, the ka'aru is uh, pierced. Ka'ari, see, one letter. The last letter is like a lion. And it turns out in Hebrew, you know, Hebrew is not like uh, American or more modern letters. It it's, has a lot of straight lines and squiggles, and it's a different kind of language. Well, it turns out that the, the letter in question, these two letters, are visually very similar. So one of the letters is what we would say, it sort of looks like an apostrophe. The other one has a little tail added to it. So the top part looks the same, more or less, and then one has a long tail and one doesn't. So you can see there's some similarities here, but they mean something very different. Well, I wonder which manuscripts say which. It turns out that the manuscripts that date to the Middle Ages, the ones that the only ones we knew about until the 1950s, which dated to around 1000 AD, that was the earliest copies, those are the manuscripts that say, like a lion. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, which date at least a thousand years earlier, guess what they say? They have pierced, ka'aru. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Now, friends, that's interesting, isn't it? At a time when Crucifixion has not even been invented yet. A prophecy about the Messiah indicates that the Messiah will somehow be pierced. Powerful words. Let's go back to Zechariah now. Let's go back to Zechariah. So God is giving a word from the Lord through the prophet Zechariah, and he's talking about some time when people will look on me God is speaking, will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. So there is kind of a shift between me and him, and prophecy and visions do that. The language shifts and morphs. What I find interesting is that when I couple, when I couple looking on the one who was pierced and a fountain being opened up, to me, those go together. That happened at Calvary. That happened at Golgotha when the fountain was opened. Because of the one that was pierced, his blood flowed. Jesus' blood paid for your sins and mine. And now the only thing waiting, the only thing missing is a yes from you and me. A full acceptance, a full surrender in the work that Jesus did for us. This was written Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. 2,000, or 500 years ago, friends. And it's already looking to the time that you could now read this and see that God's had a plan all along. He's had a plan for redemption to bring you to himself and involve Jesus, his death, and ultimately his resurrection and conquering sin and death. I'm telling you, God loves you. He loves you. Have you accepted the blood of Jesus that would pay for your sins and surrendered to him? Do that today if you haven't already. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for loving us. And, and there are parts of the scripture that are confusing, Lord, but there are some others that just jump at us. They grab us. And I celebrate 
with my brothers and sisters today that there was a fountain opened up for me and opened up for each and every one of us. Lord, I can't help but think about a fountain in a deserty part of the world. Water squirting up what that must have done in the hearts and the imaginations of people to see water squirting up out of the ground. A fountain has been opened up. And Lord, we know that fountain is the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving each person now under the sound of my voice enough that you died for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We believe that, Lord, and we turn to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Walk in the purity that Jesus provides for you. This is First Light. Thank you.